Hello everyone and welcome to episode 19 of The Scumbag. We're back from a hiatus after I got my hand stuck in a storm drain and we're we're here with Felix, of course. We have David Hayter, of course, as a wonderful guest who's gloriously given us our time. David, thank you for joining. Well, thank you for having me. Felix is uh, fully erect. <laughs> ah. Yeah, the, my uh, laptop is uh, six inches off my torso. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard it's six. Got your boner going, huh? Kind of poker with Don Colonel. Uh, what's an erect New Yorker doing on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is going to be the day that Felix dies happy, mm, or is yeah. happy. Finally, but, I can stop fucking podcasting after today. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 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 could you, D- David? Can you just say green bean in the voice? Green bean. <laughs> oh, holy oh, that's, shit! That, that, now that's we're going so awesome. viral, baby. That's so good, CJ. Yeah. Right. yeah, hell yeah. CJ's that's for you, CJ. Die. Yeah, we have a regular. <laughs> well, okay. Let's let's get away from the esotericism. I can't speak English, but David is, of course, well known as Solid Snake and various other snakes from Metal Gear series and mm-hmm. it's gonna kill me for my syntax there but also is a bloody good screenplay writer and did the most that anyone has ever done to actually make a Zack snyder film good with watchman <laughs> well, uh, yeah thank you. well thank you. felix is a big fan of of the Zack snyder films especially 300 ah uh, yes as am i <laughs> sorry but no we we are having david on the show because not only is he well known for what everything i just listed off of his wikipedia page no idea who he really is but he is also one of these people who's fantastically transitioned from this very well-known role in film and games into kind of being a political voice hmm. and it's very interesting to watch happen all over the place but in particular with someone like david who just you wouldn't expect it naturally from well, a, a director and a voiceover person, mm-hmm. and especially with the following you've got. Uh, is yeah. that right? I, I, you know, listen, I am, as a Canadian, I'm extremely well informed on American politics, and uh, I, it's difficult to stay silent when you feel that terrible things are, are occurring. But at the same time, I try not to bore my larger audience. They're, you know, the people that come to my Twitter feed or whatever for Snake aren't necessarily interested in my political views. So I've started a, a side Twitter uh, called, uh, at Political Hater for anybody who cares, you know, to know what I think about any given issue. I was actually wondering if that was you, if, because oh, yeah. with these days you've got like all the fake Trump accounts, and I wasn't sure uh, if that was the uh, uh, Oh, dude, those suck so fucking much. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I got a lot of, yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't bother to try to get myself verified for two different accounts. I figured that would be impossible. And I do have a lot of imposters, but, but yeah, typically the, the imposters are trying to pick up women or harass the women on the metal gear, uh, cast. So, um, if they're not doing that, they, they may be me. I never understood how that worked. Like guys who pretend to be someone else online to get laid, but it's like, well, like if you have sex with them, they're going to know it's like not you. Well, not only that, I, I figure they'll probably realize when they show up at your door and you're, you're not me and you don't sound like me or, or, or look like me. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how that works either. Uh, but you know, uh, it certainly I, doesn't stop them from trying. People do it all the time. Uh, I have to wonder, are they trying to have sex with the female voice actress, or do they think it's actually Meryl? (laughs) Yeah, it's (laughs) it's pretty possible. Who who knows what goes on in people's minds? Uh, You know, I think people, yes, I think a a deeply disturbed group probably thinks Meryl is real and wants a piece of that digital backside, but uh, I don't understand it, and I certainly don't condone that sort of behavior. The belief yes, that Meryl is. is real is actually the why the Eastern Church and the Catholic Church uh, split. <laughs> Was that the schism? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I went to school for theology. Yeah, and, they're, uh, like, they're like, she's not a rookie, and it's like, she is a rookie, and then, <laughs> you know, uh, many lives are, are lost. Yeah, and the, you know, Baptists and Methodists, they split because they disagreed on VR training. 
you sure. know, whether it was as good as regular combat. But, uh, yeah, well, sure. The, the, the debate rages. David, so, something that I wanted to ask you is you were you were the key part of Metal Gear Solid when it was kind of at its most prophetic about the kind of world that we'd live in, you know? Like, uh, Metal Gear Solid 1 had these huge themes about uh, sort of genetics and identity that have become this huge part of our of our politics now that we see this rise of ethno-nationalism and uh, sort of blood and soil, hard right, bio-identity shit. Mm-hmm. Metal, Metal Gear Solid 2 was, I think, even more, maybe the most prophetic game of all time because it was... It was how information would be disseminated in this world that we live in and how we live in this kind of very odd, hyper real world where it's just a million different perceptions at once. And we have we have no grasp on the past or future. Mm -hmm. Uh, Did you ever get the sense when you were when you were doing the voice of snake and big boss and three and uh, peace Walker that you were kind of, you were a part of something that was predicting the problems we'd have tomorrow. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I, I would argue that I was not the key part of that. I, I, I may have been the voice, but you know, it's re- it really comes down to Hideo Kojima's, research his dedication and his risk taking in terms of uh, you know calling out what he saw as the upcoming problems in our future how technology would mess with us and and how warfare would change i mean the guy is is a brilliant man and 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 that was always a key part of the games i was just the the dope who who got to say the lines so um, but as a relatively well-informed dope, I felt that, yes, we were saying things that uh, were definitely coming up on the horizon, and, and, uh, uh, and I was grateful to be a part of that. Ed kind of touched on how you, you have like a more of a political presence now, and like, I mean, everyone does have to be political now, because this is, you know, this is the fattest, dumbest, oldest president. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. the... Also it's the craziest, and, uh, and, and look, you just can't, I, I don't think it's responsible to stay silent, no matter who you are. You know, if you, yeah. have, if you have an audience, that's even better, because you're able to say to people on a wider, uh, on a wider range that this isn't acceptable, it isn't normal, and we need to be constantly vigilant against uh, this nonsense. Um, uh, but yeah, what was the question? <laughs> well, yeah, well, I mean, we we live in a in especially stupid and dangerous time in mm-hmm. you know world history, not just American history. But sort of touching back on how prophetic those games turned out to be, do you ever get the sense, you know, given your experience as the as the voice that you played, that a lot of this was kind of inevitable? No, this. Oh, I mean, my God, you know, <laughs> like this, this is, this shouldn't happen at all. Look, I, I think the real key is, and I, I don't really understand why people aren't more up in arms about this, but I think the real key is Fox news, um, you know, created a, a, a quote unquote legitimate news outlet that just played up to the paranoid racist fantasies of, right wingers who couldn't get people to appreciate their message because it was horrible. And so that created an echo chamber where they could essentially make it seem as if somebody like Donald Trump was a viable candidate for president. And that is so far out of any reasonable conception that I I, I don't think anybody could really have conceived that we would get somebody this bad in in office but um but that is the end result of creating a a false news echo chamber like like fox yeah and i think with with with, i think even felix was he was on stage and soldiered on with chapo the chapo boys as the horrible news came through Mm -hmm. and especially just every i'm seeing as an immigrant i'm seeing these actions being taken 
And for a moment, I was like, oh, well, you know what? I've always got home. And then Article 50 gets actioned yesterday back home in England. I'm just like, oh, fucking hell. Come on, come one of you. One of you bloody country. I'm going to Wales. I'm not technically a Welsh citizen, but I'm going back. I'm going back to live in Wales because apparently the rest of you are insane people. Mm -hmm. And now England even is becoming this. It's becoming for the first time that I can think of. We have a prime minister that mentioned God. Right. That's that's and I wouldn't be surprised if we see a British Fox News pop up as well, though they're kind of there are some columnists who are like that. There's not quite a full scale channel like you have over here. But I think I'm worried that now we're so as Felix and Chapel got it so far in the zone that we don't know what's coming next. Yeah, I think the ability for demagogues to play on racism was weakened by World War Two, and now we're yeah. seventy years out from that and Unfortunately, those strains tend to persist and tend to be very easy to pull on and 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 uh, infuriate and mislead. Uh, uh, and and so yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just. I think that you know the 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 circle turns and we come back to this again and again, and hopefully each time it is easier to stamp out, but. Um, but you always have to remain vigilant against this sort of thing rearing its head because it'll come back time and again. There will always be stupid people. There will always be racist people. And Sometimes they're both. The two are, are a dangerous combination. Well, very often they're both. And yes. that's, uh, that's a shame. I think that there was, I mean, you know, there was kind of a sense of that there there, not, there wasn't exactly a group called the Pat, the Patriots in the w- real world, but there was a sense among, I think, most people in a in a certain sphere that, like, you know, Trump couldn't win, uh, Brexit couldn't win, all this shit, all this rising tide of nationalism couldn't win because the established liberal order of the world had so much to lose, and they just wouldn't let it happen, and. I think looking back, that was just something that we like to tell ourselves that the the sort of masters of the universe were more in control than they ever actually were. We like yeah. to imagine that because it sort of it uh, it, it um, made us not have to look at this changing reality and the reality of how much hate there is in the world or in this country, how self-destructive things can be and how much the liberal order kind of failed people. Uh, And now we have this new world where we found out that that the G6, the Davos, that that Aspen Ideas Festival kind of world order, it was sort of a Potemkin village. It couldn't stand up to just in the end, a bored millionaire who didn't even really want to win and just said whatever he thought. Yeah. Well, listen, I would I, I, a couple of points there. I don't think the liberal order failed us. I think every time we get a, a, a liberal president in like Clinton or like Obama, our our world gets, you know, more peaceful. Uh, the economy gets stronger. Um, it's clear that that uh, those policies are are more beneficial for the world in general. Um, what failed us is uh, and 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 I uh, I also think you know the patriots, if there could be such a thing, are the billionaires that that run the world, the the people that run Exxon, the people that run GE or whatever. There's you know twenty mostly men who who wield enormous influence in the world. But the thing that outweighs them all is celebrity. Um, yeah. You know, and if you're a celebrity, if you're extremely well known, like Oprah talking about running for president, well, Oprah can win because everybody knows her name. Most voters don't go much beyond their own ability to name check the candidate. And uh, and celebrity is enormously powerful. You know, when I, when sorry, when George Bush was uh, president, I was very concerned that maybe the whole system is rigged. Maybe somebody that dumb, you know, can be installed by the world order. But then when Obama won, 
I realized that's not true. It's, it's really, there really is a swing to the electorate, which incredibly is usually a 51 49 split, which is amazing to me. And, you know, and then, and then Trump, I don't think the world's powerful. The Koch brothers certainly didn't want him to win, but, um, but there is flexibility in the system. And if you are a celebrity, uh, and you are good with manipulating the media, uh, you can accomplish a pretty surprising, you can, you can amass a pretty surprising amount of power. And I think, and I, well, one thing that really stuck out as well, and you can, <laughs> in the end of Metal Gear 2, this is where I'd, I'd pull it in, the there is also just this feeling of, and it's ironic we're doing this while also discussing what happened, there's no real rhyme or reason. I think that that's part of it, that we all have this. And at the end of Metal Gear 2, there's this thing where Arsenal clearly had everything in control and it could never be stopped and there was never going to be anything wrong. And just one guy with a, like one guy just went and kind of messed it up. Mm-hmm. It was over. Goodbye. The big, the big thing ended. I think everyone put this big faith in that the system would work and they're still doing it to an extent that mm-hmm. just this guy couldn't just go on and have these horrible things said. And I mean, he couldn't just go on TV and make fun of a guy with goodness. I don't even remember what, physical condition yeah, he muscular, had. Muscular the, dystrophy, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. He did that on TV. He basically went on TV and said things that Felix joke tweeted and uh-huh. and he just did whatever and everyone's like, well, the system will work. He couldn't possibly get in and I think that maybe a lot of that was why, the, well, the, that and the, I would argue, some lack of, <laughs> some, a lack of charisma with Hillary Clinton in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It meant that people were just kind of apathetic and just thought this guy is such a bumbling doofus. He's just going on and saying whatever. He's the podcast president. He's just going and rambling in a non-specific order, not really remembering what questions he was meant to prepare. Mm-hmm. But he's never going to get in. He's never going to have that power. And watching it all fall down, and still watching him still do stuff just with complete disregard to if any like checks and balances, and the checks and balances kind of being obviously built for a system which has a president that respects them. I think he mm-hmm. isn't, but everyone's also claiming he's doing this 4D chess thing. When really, I just think he's doing whatever. He's just kind of going, man. No, I mean, he, he doesn't like, th- he doesn't th- think at all. He just stays up till like 3 a.m. and like sees shit on TV and gets mad about it. The thing that dominates his thoughts are like bullshit New York real estate or media <laughs> grudges from 40 fucking years ago. Mm-hmm. This is amazing when people think he's like a strategic genius, but yeah, no, that's, that's ridiculous. Back- he, he, the guy is not yeah. playing one D checkers, but um, but you know Bannon and these people behind him are they do have a worldview, they do have um, a certain amount of media savvy, and they are manipulating him to their own ends, which is which is pretty terrifying. But but on, the other, really, but on the other hand, you know, I think there are, you know, there are for the moment anyway, checks and balances. The he he learned the hard way that Congress is not easy to to bully, uh, nor is the judiciary, nor is the intelligence community. So hopefully the system will continue to if Felix had 15 minutes of Trump, because the last person, as Felix has said, that talks to Trump is usually the one that informs his opinion. If he right. had 15 minutes, he could convince him the Shadow Moses incident was real. I oh, think. It, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, print it up you, on, you could do on, it. on Breitbart and show him the article. I'm sure he would buy it in a second. Or just DM him. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I mean, he is, he is the podcast, but he does the same thing which I do. I'm a, as a podcaster where I don't prepare at all. I don't know anything. I watch the same TV show every day. For him, it's Fox and Friends. For me, it's a banshee, and it informs both of our worldviews. But uh, uh, I think on, that- on that note, Ivana Malitsevic is a, an old friend of mine, and I can highly recommend Banshee and Ivana as as a as a person to look up to. And if she says to do it, you sh- you should do it. Banshee kicks so much fucking ass. That show kicks ass. It's so good. Uh, but uh, I think that um, Metal Gear Solid 2 was kind of prophetic because it it sort of predicted the so- society without any social movements, without that was just hyper individual to the point that everyone lived in their own constructed reality of tailored information. Mm-hmm. And there was sort of a question over what was real or what was not. And 
people were powerless, not because of a totalitarian government necessarily, but because there was no unified social movement. And, you know, when we were talking about swings in the electorate, you know, it was, uh, you know, Obama was the first person I ever voted for. Mm. He ran when I turned 18 and it was amazing to see him win. But it was also like you could quite clearly see the limitations of somebody who is going to work so much inside that system without a cohesive social movement. I mean, he had this amazing organizing vehicle that they just sort of let fall into a disrepair. Mm. And I think that's sort of out of design. Like you can't. If you have a cohesive social movement, it is going to advocate for and agitate for things that are outside of what we describe as the confines of political reality in a liberal order. Um, and I think, you know, I was another thing that I've been thinking about with Trump is this we do have this seesaw movement in the world, and it is that presidents that we are not necessarily liberal, but we describe as defending liberal values. Reagan would be one. They have a habit of backing up these highly reactionary groups in foreign countries, be they the Taliban or the Haqqanis in Afghanistan, as Reagan and Carter did, or, you know, Nicaraguan death squads. And they they create these mass movements of people and they end up it ends up coming back to us and it creates these social tensions which play into a rightward shift, a nationalist shift, a racist shift. I mean, I think undoubtedly Trump is sort of the consequence of people who had their worldview defined by 9-11, unfortunately. Yeah. And I also don't think 9-11 – it's very unlikely it would have happened if we didn't go dick first into Afghanistan starting in you know 79. And I think – we could talk about the, the the electoral swings and the triumphs of the liberal system, but I think this is a key feature of the liberal system is this swing that we get as a consequence of our international activities, even under the liberal Democrat presidents. Yeah, yeah. well, I don't think that's a I don't think that's a result of liberalism as much as it is a, a quest for profits. Uh, you know, I think nine eleven's backlash was primarily out of. Our dealings with Saudi Arabia and going in and, um, you know, propping up uh, immoral regimes for the sake of oil profits. And that comes back to bite you in the ass. It's it's um, I think it's the I think it's the betrayal of liberal values and saying, well, look, we care about human rights at home, but we don't care about it in oil producing countries because we really want that oil. So, um, you know, there's a certain amount of hypocrisy that breaks down people's faith in America as a shining city on the hill, particularly if you're getting shot by Nicaraguan death squads or or what have you that have been propped up for the sake of uh, American fruit companies or or whoever else is making a profit. And that's what I feel like that one of the reasons I love Metal like I don't know, I can't even remember the reviews of Metal Gear Solid 4, but something about that game that I really liked was it was as I liked in the sense that I thought it was great storytelling and acting and so on was that game was like the most obscene definition of the end of what the Middle East could be. Basically, yes, yes. So everything basically, yeah. and everything, yeah. Just capitalism shooting other capitalism for other capitalists to get more money, and it's yep. just this horrible. And watching this, uh, you actually re- and just compliment to you. You did. It's it must be difficult to do that with just your voice, but you did play it tired. There was a real oh, just, yeah. yeah, just just complete malaise around Snake. Just to the end, like that one shot, which is probably one of my favorite moments in games where he's just there and he's on his knees in front of Metal Gear, just kind of like, oh, just end the bloody thing. Right. (laughs) Right. Well, you know, that was part of the construct of the game is that I was aging rapidly and deteriorating as we went. But, but yeah, it really played into, you know, Kojima's amazingly prescient breakdown of how war for profit was going to go. And uh, uh, yeah, it's an interesting perspective. I haven't heard that before. And it's it's funny as well, though, because the one thing that made me think Metal Gear a lot in the last few months was watching the people who, 
if they didn't play Metal Gear, they definitely read a lot of those, what, Clive Cussler or whatever novels. The mm. kind of, they want to be, as Felix describes them, those ice-chewing CIA agents. They want right. to be Solid Snake, so you've got, like, time for a little game theory and all that. I don't mm. know if you subjected yourself to garland poisoning recently, but I Eric Garland and I his... I don't know what that is. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ruin your life. Then oh, just by telling you, it's a guy who who went on a big rant. I feel bad for him because he's possibly abusing Adderall. He said, oh. but he went on this big rant that started time for a little game theory, and it was just you're seeing a lot of this happen in this desperate time when everyone's trying to find out what happened and no one really has a good answer because it's so confusing why we have the large balloon orange haired man <laughs> running a company country or a company depending on how he looks at it that day and so you're seeing all these different reactions where it's like the cia is going to stop russia with this and that and they kind of if not thinking directly of a metal gear they're dreaming of this time when their idea of um, a secret agent can go and sort something out maybe the seal the seal team six style thing when i always felt like metal gear did a better job of describing especially in like snake eater well, Na- Naked Slate was just such a... He and everyone else has just forgotten. Just as forgotten relics. You just, you're out yeah. there. You yeah. have a mission, but nah. Well, not I only that, that but, but what I love about the Metal Gear games is it's typically not... You know, the mission that Snake is sent on is not the main goal of the, no. of the brass, of the people in charge. He finds out along the way he's been lied to, and he's, you know, <laughs> he's pursuing the boss for all the wrong reasons, and... You know, everybody's everybody's running a game on on Snake and on everybody else, and, and I think that's pretty pretty real. But let, uh, let me just say, as a as a potential ray of hope, yes, things are confusing. Yes, things are are scattered. Yes, there are a billion different view, viewpoints coming in at all times. But I think that one of one of the things that I had hope in in terms of the internet back in the day was that there would be a certain element of truth that would be revealed. For example, um, kids in oppressed Middle Eastern nations would see more uh, of the so-called free nations and the freedom they get, the freedom to listen to the music they want, to dress how they want, to accept or deny religion as, as they care to do, and that that would seep into their DNA and that they would... Uh, you know, be able to be better equipped to fight back against the oppression they've got. And I think we saw a bit of that in the Arab, Arab Spring. Now, of course, everything backlashed on them, but I don't think that that conversation is over. I think that there no. is a core of truth which is revealed through through the internet that uh, that the despots can't fight. That if you look at the news that's aggregated through legitimate serv- uh, services like you know the New York Times or Reuters, AP, BBC, you know, these, these people are focusing on the same essential truths day after day. Um, that's why we're getting this. That's why Trump can't tr- stop this Russia story. It's just too obvious. It's too glaring. And, and I think there is an element of hope there. I think that people need to be less afraid of the scattering effect of the internet and, and, and really just focus down on what they see as the truth. You may not always be right, but I think it is there to be uncovered. So uh, I, I don't yeah. think the situation is hopeless. It's just scary and confusing. I agree with you. I, I don't think it's hopeless either. I do think I would caution people against uh, against thinking that there will be sort of a silver bullet that yeah. we can find in any investigation. But the more encouraging thing that I've seen, something that is uh, – you know, I th- everyone fucked up their predictions this past year. Um, one thing I am happy to have fucked up is that I didn't think we would start to see social movements grow again. Right. And there has actually been a huge social movement response to Trump. And there have been huge protests, the likes of which I didn't know we could do in America anymore. Yeah. And yeah. I think we may not have most... been able to do without the, without the internet, without without being able to inform millions upon millions of people, um, and and create a like minded movement. That's that's why Trump is at thirty six percent, which is pretty encouraging. <laughs> and pretty yeah, it's encouraging. very yeah. It 
It took us like 60 – for Bush to get there, we needed to, to destroy two countries, to kill 3,000 American soldiers, to to, to – dr- yeah, to drown a fucking major American city. For two U.S. reps to turn out to be pedophiles, yeah. for Bush one, to get to that point, it had took to six, die. Yeah, it literally – it took so much dead bodies for Bush to get to that point. And Trump has killed his fair share of people at this point. He has his, you know, the military under his his guys has committed horrible war crimes. You know, even worse than that which Obama committed in two thousand nine in Yemen or in uh, Kunduz. But it's it is good that it took us this quickly to get to this point. Yeah, and, people, and, I think and people didn't other, give him a chance. And one other. Uh, uh, one other bit of optimism, you know, you were saying you don't think that there will be a silver bullet. I don't think people should hang their hang their hopes on a silver bullet. But remember, this guy is so dumb and cannot shut his mouth ever, whether he's being recorded, especially if he's being recorded or not. So for him to be talking out loud on tape about collusion with the Russians, I don't think is beyond uh, possibility. Uh, yeah. You know, this is not a savvy operator. You know, this is just a, a, a free floating id that spews whatever's in his, in his head. In fact, you know, somebody was saying, I think it was Samantha B or somebody was saying, you want evidence of collusion with the Russians. This idiot went out at a press conference and set, told them to release Hillary's act, hacked emails. So, you know, I, I f- would not be surprised. I would not be surprised if a silver bullet did not show up. But if a piece of tape showed up saying with, you know, uh, Trump talking directly to Putin about how they were going to screw over the American people, that would not surprise me either. Yeah. And but, but it would be Putin. Putin would be like just sitting it there completely Putin. yeah, quietly. Putin, Putin's too smart for that. But but there completely but quietly is not. Like, be like, yes, hello, Mr. Trump. And Trump would be like, yeah, well, going to work with Vladimir Putin and the Russians to destroy Hillary Clinton. Treason time. Like, yeah. it just, that's it. And Putin, like, and that's, Putin would be like, uh, your, br- your signal is breaking up. I can't. Uh, uh, what was that? Number, wrong number. Wrong number. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm more skeptical about there being a Russian silver bullet than most people. But I also, I do think we should never forget that Trump, like, copped two sexual assaults on tape to impress Billy Bush. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, like, anything is possible. Like, Billy he could Bush just fucking well. say. He, yeah, he didn't just, it's not like he was like talking to like someone he knew forever and was like, yeah, I did all these rapes. It was like to Billy Bush. And he was like, I really want him to think that I'm cool. Yeah, while yeah. Mike. While yeah. Mike. <laughs> yeah. Like this is, this yeah, is supposedly an experienced television performer. He's, he's got a mic on his lapel and he's trying to impress Billy Bush with his sexual assault stories. So and he's trying to impress Billy Bush as well. Of all like the most well, pathetic. There, yeah. There are yeah. so many. There are so many levels of of, of, of there was so many. Um, well, I think that that was also so indicative, though, of how much of a desperate, anxious, sad man he is as well, though, because he's yeah. so desperate. He's like, like, like Felix was saying, is like angry about like forty year old real estate deals gone wrong. Yeah, mad, mad that people are mad at him for hiring illegal immigrants that he hates, but also uses. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's just, he's just this. It, there's something deeply depressing about it, and I guess I'd feel sorry for him if he wasn't just categorically fucking so much of the world up. Yeah. But it's also the weird encouragement I got, and this is a really minor thing, but was watching the Breitbart comment section about this whole internet freedom thing. Or well, it was the, the right. ISPs now can legally Be like show that I'm looking at hentai or whatever. Mm. And. Like, watching the comments section go there, because it just shows how thinly they actually truly believed in him or stood by anything that really, they were just looking for a chance to say the N-word and it'd be yeah. okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, I mean, look, the, the, that's the real thing, is all of these policies, you know, I tweeted about the Liberal Tears mug. Everybody was tweeting, I'm drinking Liberal Tears, and I was like, drink them up, guys. They were for you. I, you know, I'm a I'm a relatively well off, you know, Caucasian entertainment person. Uh, my health care is covered. Uh, I've got I've got enough income to weather this this storm, hopefully. But these poor people, 
in the rural areas who are were fired up by nationalism or racism or or whatever are going to lose their health care. They're losing their privacy. So am I. Um, there's a number of different ways they're going to get boned, and 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 that's the real shame. And hopefully they will uh, wake up and defend themselves because they're really being played yeah. by the worst of the worst now. It's just and the I worst think, of the corporate. And I think that's something the left needs to really stop doing as well, coming down these people. You know what? I can kind of get, if you're that angry what saying this, I just hate I hate it because it's kind of playing into the kind of hatred that got us in this position. Mm-hmm. And the people who are like, yeah, the Trump people deserve to die if they vote for Trump. It's like, no it's actually really difficult to vote. If you think about what voting is and how much you truly would need to know, even if you were day in, day out reading politics, you could probably still not make a totally informed vote. And 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 these people, these people are just, they're probably not particularly well educated, but even I, I wouldn't say I'm like a super smart person, but I read enough. And even then I was like, I don't really understand totally what either person is doing. Well, I mean, th- these these people also – I think it's important to keep bringing this up. Every time Trump does something that fucks over the working class, which is every single day he, there's an executive order or something he puts out that does this, people talk about you know coal miners. Like there are any fucking coal miners left in America. Mm-hmm. Look, they blame poor Trump voters and – you know what? There really aren't that many poor Trump voters because poor people don't fucking vote. I am so sick of the obsession of the sort of the liberal punditry of shitting on this mythical white working class Trump voter. There are some, but Trump's base are – it's like any authoritarian movement in history. His base are rich suburbanites or mm-hmm. middle class suburbanites. And we have this obsession with sort of beating down on these people in West Virginia and shit. And yeah, like he – he won there, but his base is not the working class, and I think we we really have to understand the working class doesn't vote because – for many reasons. I mean they can't get a fucking day off. Like, they don't have the choice. Yeah, and we, we kind of harangue these people through the media, and I think we really – and we really should examine that. And ironically, we're kind of the people saying these things like and even if it is a case where it's a, a lower middle class, lower class person, I actually abhor those terms. But for the sake for the sake of this conversation, it's like, you know what? They got fucking fooled. A lot of people got fucking fooled and lied to. Oh, yeah. And also on top of it, guess what? There have been failures of liberal presidents too. And on top of that, oh, these people are desperate and sad. They are they're angry because they feel powerless. And as I've said many times about Trump, he won because he effectively went to the base human emotion of you don't like the bad man, I'll punch the bad man in the face. Right. And people right. people, the, people the, per- to- the people that are responsible for keeping you down. He just he he misled them. And you know, as far as uh, you wealthy suburbanite Republicans, uh, yeah, I blame them a lot more than I do somebody who is, you know, less educated because they're voting because they think they're going to get a big tax cut. Well, they're going to get a medium tax cut. That's fine. But when he trashes the economy, I got a huge tax cut when when Bush was in office, and then I lost a third of my net worth at the end of his term because the the economy fell apart. So. Yeah, enjoy your tax cut, dipshit. Yeah, it's 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 this it's this sad world we live in, and it's and what it's going to do as well to bring bring it back like we always do on this podcast to Metal Gear, but also to just entertainment <laughs> in general. <laughs> really, really, David, just listen to the episodes. It's actually kind of worrying. But listen, we, I, I I don't think there's any greater path to legitimacy than to constantly bring your political conversation back to Metal Gear. Yeah, it works for me. <laughs> but it's entertainment. I feel like is going to now go up its own asshole and start talking about this. Like we're good. Like as Matt Lubchansky said, he's a great artist and quite great on Twitter as well. It's like imagine how bad the next next Aaron Sorkin thing is going to be. And guess mm-hmm. what? We don't even need to wait because we have your. Le- well, I don't know how you feel about him, but I think he's a way worse person, way way worse snake than you were. Kiefer Sutherland in Designated Survivor mm-hmm. is just that is just that show is such a if it, it is currently responding 
to Trump in this really weird way. They had like an episode with like the Michigan governor, uh, governor refusing to do things and he's refusing to stop police beating up Muslim people. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it was this weird, like erect West Wing fantasy show. That is just well, I, I've never seen it. I, I can't it's, really it's comment. Just, it's, it's just like, no, but that's where I see entertainment going and I hope it doesn't fully, but I don't want to see... But the joy fall out of entertainment because of this deeply depressing time because it kind of kind of happened around the Bush era too. There was where, where oh, the yeah, hope went well, away. Well, look at when Reagan was in office. You know, entertainment got really cheesy and frothy, and uh, you know, it. it look, I, I think you make a mistake as a as an artist or a writer trying to reflect the exact moment you're in because four years from now it may be entirely different. God. I hope it is entirely Fingers different. Crossed. Um, but uh, yeah, no. Uh, my my own opinion as a as a screenwriter is always go for the true timeless story of you know particularly in my like I'm I'm working on a show with I'm putting together a show with John Carpenter right now and we're talking oh, about what makes the the iconic John Carpenter character and it's. A good man, a flawed man in a deeply flawed system trying to change things, you know, and that's that never goes away, whether you've got Obama as president or 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 Trump or whatever. There's always going to be evil in the world. There's always going to be a system that needs breaking down. And it's always going to be inspiring to see somebody badass take that on. And I think Snake embodies that as well. Uh, I mean, particularly because he was inspired you, by John Carpenter himself. Anyway. Yes, and one of one of oh, the yeah. greatest series of movies ever. And I wish they'd do Escape from Earth, but that actually does right. lead to probably I my I final would do Escape from Earth. Oh my god! If you did, I, I they should fucking put you in that. I would, they need to do. They need to do it now. <laughs> they need to do it now. Yeah, yeah, we do. Well, now I actually have a really important question for you, though, then, about Black Widow. Uh-huh. Because I feel like uh, it was like two years ago you brought it up again. And I, did you finish that entire script. I feel like now is the time that we need it. But oh, it's, I, I it, tend to agree. <laughs> yeah, It's just it, well, to your theme of and especially with I thought Civil War was kind of meh. Yeah. And I think it was kind of meh because it wasn't. It the original that they did this clever thing at the beginning where it was about a flawed city, they, but they had too many people and too many things going on. They clearly had like eight hundred voices in the room. Mm-hmm. But a Black Widow movie could be really interesting right now. Oh, I agree. Well, particularly, I mean, you know, the way mine was written, she came up. In, it started with her in the eighties, uh, being trained in the uh, the KGB. Soviet Union era. And so, you know, I think it's valuable to talk about that regime and that, that government construct, um, as it applies to, to all of our problems today, metaphorically, it's a, it's a, it's a construct that, especially when you put a child at its mercy is particularly merciless, is particularly indefensible and, and really, puts things into perspective. You know, when we had the Nazis or the KGB or whatever, things were a lot more clear cut. Now, now we don't even know if our president is a tool of Russia. So everything is, is a little more muddied. It's, it's, it's a lot cooler to see something that is clear cut and to be able to say, yeah, that child should fight back against that system because that's inherently unfair. And even the terms of war that we work within, um, MGS4 again, naturally, Mm -hmm. even then, MGS4, you had some robots and Revengeance, I realize you weren't really part of, but nevertheless, you had like robots. But now you don't even necessarily have troops doing anywhere near as much of the fighting. We are getting this weird, like just drone strikes are happening, which is dehumanizing war. Mm-hmm. which is a scary concept unto itself because it's like, why are we fighting? Oh, does it really matter? We blew up this thing mm-hmm. because we, like, okay, we, we, because no one's really pulling a trigger. No one's thinking about the action because a robot's flying into it. And we're in this terrifying world now where I wonder how far that goes. And I mean, I, I wish that they do a black widow movie. I don't know about the casting of Scarlett 
Johansson. I mean, actually, that's a good question. Who would you have actually cast, though? If, if you would have cast oh. her, that's a fine answer. Well, back in the day, I don't know, we were talking about the attractive redheads of, of the world. We were talking about Jessica Biel, and we were talking about... Um, I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, 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 I, I like Scarlett quite a bit. I, I think she, she is such a star that, that at least it, it draws a, a, an outsized amount of attention to your movie. Um, but it's, it's not real. Sad, sadly, including Lucy. Yeah, it's a, well, I like Lucy. I, I like Luke Besson. He's, he's just, he's gonzo and amazing. And so, <laughs> yeah. uh, I kind of like Lucy, but, um, it's, it really comes down to the script. It really comes down to the ideas you're willing to put forward that the studio is willing to put forward. Uh, yeah. and, and are you willing to be edgy with it or, or does it all just get blanded out because you're afraid of offending anybody? That's, that's, and that's, that's what, where the real problem comes in. And it's that's why that, you're probably going to see the Justice League movie be incredibly boring because it seems like it, it looks just so dull. I've yeah, never well, seen... It's like, I don't know. I mean, I can't comment on that know, my, my friends at warner brothers but uh but uh, yeah that's the danger with these films they you know they get so expensive that people are well, afraid to say anything edgy one way or the other and then and then you know but th- but then you know look at deadpool look at logan look at films that are are willing to take risks are 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 resulting in better films so cooler films right. One, th- one thing I do miss as well about the X-Men films, which they really did bring back with First Class and complimenting you, was one of the reasons I really liked X and X2 was that they were fun. They didn't yeah. feel... They, they were still, like, they were very high stakes, but they were still fun. They still had that sense of adventure. Mm-hmm. And I think the more, like, we still, we really, more now than ever, need that in film and entertainment. Need- that's, that's something that's been missing from films for a while. I mean... I would, I've been uh, going on a nostalgia tour of uh, er, early mid '90s action, mm-hmm. and oh, like, yes. dude, watch fucking Out for Justice, best Seagal movie ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, last Boy Last Boy Scout, oh, one of the movie. best. Also, one of the best action action movies now. Like most of the time, they're like. It, 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 they're all like the heroes are all like very bloodless desexualized people there's like nothing they don't do anything fun or cool like you or don't human. You, you just, or yeah. human yeah and, and in those movies like well, why did last boy scout rule because bruce willis like played sort of this like fucked up loser who could kill anyone with a gun and it was awesome <laughs> And, and it was a kind of a, it also was very dark, especially that immediate ent- that entrance, the kind of yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and ain't life a bitch like that horrible line, but it also had the amazing it was the Wayans line where it was like, yeah, it's the kind of key, the kind of key that shreds. You don't really get that fun anymore, that levity. And Metal Gear had it as well. There was still within this very dark and grimy story, there was still a t- like Snake Eater with that theme. The, like you only live twice style one, right? Right. It's missing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a tough uh, look. It's a tough balance to strike. Uh, you have to have a director who is strong enough to, to make a statement. You know, like like uh, like Brian Singer was on on the first two movies and on on the most recent movies. And he, I, I, you know, you, you just have to. The thing about making a good movie is it's all about overcoming the fear of the people that are putting the money up. Yeah. You know, they, mm. they, they, uh, for good reason, have a huge say in how they want their money spent. But sometimes the artists making the film have to put their foot down and say, look, if we don't have this edge, if we don't have this humor, if we don't have this human behavior, if we don't have a real character, it won't work. You'll lose your money anyway. Uh, and sometimes that's a tough argument to make because sometimes really bland movies make a huge amount of money. So, um, and, and that's you know. and that's the the other struggle as well is we we're talking about how entertainment was re- reflective of the time. Maybe that's because that's what people kind of want. They either want escapism or they want to feel like they're watching something relevant to themselves. Mm. And that's why you I I'd argue you can look back and see it. Well, maybe that. I, not being particularly old in the 80s, the ton of amazing 80s horror movies, these very distant 
horror movies. I mean, was it? It was the thing's Carpenter, right? Or am I completely oh, yeah. wrong? Yeah, no, it, then, no, that's his finest film, as far as I'm. My, one of the scariest thing. spider-related things ever. Uh-huh. And I mean, it was just. Uh, but there were a lot around the eighties. There were just these amazing, gritty, grimy films. And I remember talking to my brother about it. It's just because people were pretty depressed. There's movies like Threads, if you've ever seen it, which was about no. a nuclear weapon hitting Sheffield. It okay. was an example of the anxiety of the time. So maybe mm. that's a big part of it as well. And that's why we haven't seen this great amount of levity in entertainment recently. Maybe people. I don't think people were particularly happy with Obama towards the end. I don't think they felt respected. And I've done. Well, I, listen, I think that's a bunch of nonsense. I, I don't think there's a. I, not well, the, that they didn't were, feel what? respected. I think that's that may be true. I think they were respected. The man was incredibly yes. respectful on all sides. He was one of our one of the greatest diplomats we've ever had in the White House. But he's got this horrific right wing media saying this guy's saying this and this guy's you, you know respecting you I, and I fell into and, a trap. I fell yeah, into they, a trap there because it's a very big thing we do here. But we talk about the administration using the name of the president. Mm-hmm. So that I fell into my own trap there. No, Obama was very respectful, but at the time people felt help. People felt res- they felt helpless because yeah, because Fox News was telling them, "Look, if you're poor, it's Obama's fault, and he doesn't care about you." He, you know, and they'd twist his words and they'd say all these horrible things, and it was just nonsense. But people believed it, and so yeah. yes, was there a large section of the electorate that felt disrespected? Sure. Was that based in reality? No, it was based in manipulation and listening to idiots like Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity. Or you take away necessarily the conservatism and demo- Democrat side there, and you just focus on this other thing, which is I think might really be the root the root of a lot of this, which is I really feel like people just felt because of the financial crisis. And I, this is my greater theory is you take away the some of the politics of it, though politics kind of affected this. It's that people had less freedom of movement. They had less opportunities. Loans were harder to get. Yeah. Loans were harder to get. Mortgages especially, so people couldn't buy houses. The American dream kind of became impossible for tons of people as a result of really horrible things that happened under the Bush administration. And frankly, Obama walked into this mess. And I think that carried through because, and people, fairly or unfairly, I don't have the answer. I don't think fairly, personally, but I'm also quite dumb. I don't think it's his fault that the the banks were allowed to basically just sit there and be like, yeah, we're just going to take less less and less risk, even though we had fun profiting billions of that. So they basically the banks and a lot of these a lot of these places where people relied upon the system to back them up aren't able to get loans. They 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 can choose to go to college if they can even afford to get in. Mm. And if they can afford to get in, they go into debt. So they were in this horrible spiral. So perhaps take the administration out of it. It's just the the economic state we're in right now and we're in made people desperate because mid, the lower middle and even upper middle class couldn't get loans. And so there was this anti-elitist thing, which was, going back to your Fox News point, really bloody easy to play with. Ironically, yeah. with Trump, like the most elitist fuck in the world. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, Trump is that kind of anti-elitism. It's more cultural than uh, class, but we also don't have that much uh, class consciousness in America. That's kind of uh, – which is kind of by design. Like no one really wanted people – we have this massive group of tens of millions of people who are on the border of poverty but not quite there, and they have – this sort of pride in not being so poor that they can get Medicaid or, or you know, uh, social security or unemployment insurance. But you know, it's sort of a hackneyed quote. You know, the one about temporarily embarrassed millionaires, but it is kind of true. Like there is a vested interest in people in America not noticing massive wealth inequality a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, and a lot of this comes from turning businesses that shouldn't be for profit into for profit businesses. So, yeah, you used to be able to go to college affordably, you used to be able to go to university affordably, and but they but the Republicans made it more and more for profit. They made healthcare for profit. They made 
you know, pretty soon we'll be paying to have the police come to our house or the fire department or whatever. They want to privatize everything. And you're already the seeing people that in get, Oakland. The more, they, the more the Republicans succeed in blaming liberals for that, which I, I, that's a neat trick. I don't know how they manage it. Well, I mean, uh, to, uh, that is it is mostly a Republican program. But to be fair, there are a lot of Democrats who push this line, too. I mean, Andrew Cuomo is one of them. Andrew Cuomo and Rahm Emanuel and Daley before him in Chicago, these sort of guys who we broadly ascribe as big city liberals, they do push a very rapid program of privatization mm -hmm. and making things effectively way more expensive for the poorest people. This sort of re regressive taxation model that is this neoliberal privatization program. And it's you know, it isn't just a it isn't just a Republican problem. This is yeah. Well, that, that, know, that's fair. I I shouldn't uh, put it all on the Republicans, but um, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put I'll put most of it on the Republicans. I, I think it's also a part part of the American DNA to say, oh well, business should run everything, and and it's all you know, it's profit is king, and and all that stuff. And it's like, you know, if you look at healthcare, for example, healthcare in Canada, healthcare in. The Scandinavian countries, you know, they pay less. They have a higher quality of care. That's, you know, I'm sure people are howling right now. That's those are verifiable facts. They pay far I mean, less for health care than we I grew do. Up in, I grew up in England. Yeah. My father ran one uh, a large part of the primary health care trust. And mm -hmm. the NHS is and the flipping conservatives over there, the way they talk about it. And God knows where the NHS survives. It's just when I came here. The, the the just weird mirror world of like having to pay for a doctor's visit yeah. was just it was just obscene and people will uh, people would talk about how like it was something you earned you yeah. earned yeah. this right like you're you not to going to like you're all going to end up in the hospital at some point you are all going to die you are all going to become sick at some point because that's how human beings are designed and our system in the united states designs it so that if you're not immensely wealthy at the end of your life you're going to lose everything all that money is going to be sucked out by you know some greedy jerk uh whereas in canada we we believe that that everybody deserves support and you shouldn't have to go broke because you have a heart attack which so, is just, and it's the most obscene conversation. I had it with someone out obscene. in Central California. I can't remember specifically who it was related to my fiance's family. And it was just like this, I couldn't even quite have the argument. So it basically came down to me being like, I don't think you should have to earn not dying. Yeah. Like that doesn't, that doesn't seem like, a, he's like, well, you know what? I work hard to pay for my health insurance. I'm like, but should you, should you have to? Like, do you, yeah, is, right. did you choose to get sick? If so, yeah. why? These guys, these guys always like call people cucks. But the biggest cuck thing you can do, nothing is cucking harder than like arguing for private health insurance if you're just a normal person. Oh, totally. Who is it? Who isn't an executive or stakeholder in one of these companies? Like, what? What? I I honestly wonder what happens to a person where they're just a normal guy um, who makes average income, and they're like, yeah, no, pr look. Private health insurance is great. I love everyone who does it. I love paying this. <laughs> I love this established I love the great system. People at, at Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, like who this week, that, yeah, who this week that decided be... a, medica a medication I've been on for four and a half years. They decided I, I just out of nowhere needed a pre-existing. Uh, it was sorry, not pre. -existing. I need an authorization just out of nowhere, and because my doctor took two days to get back to them. I had to pay for it, and I have to now go through a two month process to get two hundred and seventy five dollars. Yeah, Thanks, and, guys. And let me let me clarify your like you were saying. I don't think anybody should have to die uh, for for your health care. Well, uh, I I think it's a little different. They everybody's going to die. You're going to die. Yes, the question certain. is, should you have to go broke because you get old? And uh, that yeah. that is essentially un-American, as far as I'm concerned. That is a that is the that is There's, the most evil part. You've got, of, you've got liberty, I guess, sort of the pursuit of happiness, but not quite life. Yeah, and a guarantee that you will lose everything if you uh, have if not become rich happens. by the end of your life. So it's 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 it is absolutely obscene. It is demonstrably less 
effect cost effective than and less uh, care effective than the single payer systems. And just to address all the people who are like, yeah, but people have to wait for care and in in England or the NHS or in Canada or whatever. Which is bollocks. Yes. Well, it it ha- it happens, and I do know Canadians who will come down and pay for an MRI or whatever to to I was there accelerate for twenty one years. And my mum had, my dad had cancer. My mum had bronchitis. My grandmother spent many years of her life in hospital. And yes, mm-hmm. I had an injury to my foot. I had quite serious. I had the mumps at like nineteen because mm-hmm. I I didn't get I didn't get the inoculation for some reason. Mm-hmm. Duh, just. But no, that was actually not their fault. But nevertheless, in all cases, yeah, I had to wait maybe 20 minutes to the appointment. And maybe once I waited for an hour on a normal doctor's visit. But right. like, you know what? Not like people are lining up out the emergency room door yeah, they, and waiting to get this, their gunshot treated. And there's this insane view that like, that that's the world, that it's this this 25 person line out the door waiting to get their health stamp. Yeah. Just it. I don't. Und- I just don't understand the mindset. We, well, we just, live in a very it's just lies. World. But um, uh, let me tell. Let me tell you a story that may appeal more to your younger audience. Uh, I was in Tijuana with a friend of mine from Canada, um, and we. I won't get into the details, but there was a bit of a scuffle, and my friend ended up putting his fist through a window and nearly slicing his the tendon of his thumb his uh his right thumb right all the way through and um so we washed it out with bottled water as you do and wrapped it in a napkin and went to bed and then the next day wandered across the border went to the uc san diego medical center he got his thumb his tendon stapled back together they fixed him up it was about a five thousand dollar bill he took it back to canada and they were like oh yeah we'll pay for that and it was nothing. Jesus. It cost him nothing. So it's it's almost miraculous how easy it is to get health care under a single payer system. And the fact that they fight tooth and nail against it is obscene. Yeah, I mean, even like I mean, even poor countries like Spain is a far poorer nation than the United States and has 60 percent youth unemployment in some cities. Wow. But they're still able to pay for everyone. Right. It's when you don't like when you don't put literal trillions of dollars into fucking fighter jets that don't actually fly yeah. and well, everything else tanks that we're not going to use. And yeah. yeah, no, there's a there's a fraction of the defense budget could be taken out and cover everyone easily. And the fact that they don't do that is obscene and irresponsible. We just today it was announced that they're putting Chris Christie in charge of like solving the opiate crisis. Friend, friend and it's of like, the show, congratulations! Friend of the show, Chris Christie. But it's like, how much are they spending on that? Like, how yeah. much do they spend on that? Just these programs run by like highly reactionary, stupid people that aren't going to accomplish anything. Well, and if you and if you look at Chris Christie. You know, you can tell that that man is a paragon of personal discipline and yeah. uh, responsibility. Like that is a guy who would never abuse his body, and yeah. um, <laughs> and, and and thank God he's looking all, out for the all the, lo- all the local subway artists. Yeah, when they get his order wrong, he definitely is someone who's been in the subway and yelled at them. Oh, can, oh, can you can you imagine or, or like him? <laughs> can you? Can, can you fucking imagine being like you went to Afghanistan in 2002 because you enlisted after 9-11 and you you got maimed by an IED and you come back and you lived in the Rust Belt and there are no like unions have been destroyed. You have no opportunities. You have a searing pain in your back every day. You take Opana just not to kill yourself. But then after, you know, like 15 years of misery, Chris Christie shows up at your door and screams <laughs> at you about 9-11. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's this is a great program. I'm very excited to see what he can accomplish. He's going to save the part of the country I'm from, the Midwest. He's going to Midwest is coming back very specifically as well. Like not like all drugs, just some. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, This country rules. I love it. It's but it's it's funny, though, that you talk about I think it's a good place, good place to round this back to 
to the to the end of the podcast, but also to Metal Gear again because we it's all we talk about on the scumbag. But- Chris Christie was Fat Man from Metal Gear Solid Two. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Time is short. <laughs> it really is for him, um, but it's it, but it's it's funny though because those games I remember doing well and I remember getting that that beautiful box set one. They're really expensive. I saved up. I got that lovely big boxed edition of the first one. But throughout those games as well, it's weird when they were reviewed. At least in England, I remember people talking about how it like fetishized the military. But when you actually looked at it, Snake himself was kind of pathetic. He was, there were so many points where like they did the moments where like the scientists peed themselves, but just about everyone who was a soldier mm-hmm. who was even strong or had a big gun kind of at some point looked kind of shitty and lame. Like, like everyone, everyone got like liquid ended up in someone's arm. Like he was just like, yeah, that's, yeah. That's yeah. Lot went from this like handsome guy to looking like a guy who spends like five, like, 500 grand a year on the slots in a Harrah's and well, you know, my, my, just- my theory on that, I think, I think Kojima, I can't speak for him, but I will. Uh, he, I think he felt a little trapped by, by his creation, uh, you know, in Hollywood, we call it the golden handcuffs. You know, he had to keep, he kept saying, I'm not going to do snake again. I'm not going to do snake. And the demand was so great. He kept coming back and snake kept getting more abused and kept getting older and, then Raiden tried to take over. You know, it was like this constant bashing of his own creation, and I think uh, some I think of that frustration came out through the through the design. Of the well, character. I mean, you've got that you've got that amazing voice you did, and like it's this kind of this very the the whole ma- the machismo of the whole thing, and even in sadly the one you didn't voice, they've the, I think Kojima and the Metal Gear series did something very powerful with the storytelling, which was the. Sure, on the surface it might look like, and especially in the Twin Snakes, which was my favourite version, and you you made a big sacrifice, and thank you. Oh, it's it's thank you for your service. But it's, <laughs> it's it's one of those things where when you really look like even a level deeper, everyone looks terrible. Every single person. Snake is just a little bit on the moral high ground, but he's still a mass murder. He still killed so many people. Mm-hmm. So many people are dead and he's part. And in the end, he is not, he's, he's like a clone. Mm-hmm. And it's just this weird, it's just this weird storyline. that's quite, quite magical in his geopolitical discussion, but also just how there are vast swords of people who have no respect for or consideration of human life, not just on the macro level, but on that micro level that every game is this collection of just forgotten people. No matter how powerful you are, you might be a Volgan who gets pulled up again to fight again. Or you might, like you said, maybe Kojima felt tired. Maybe it was always his plan with it. But Snake just, by the end of it, was just this old man. He's just like, oh, God, do I have to? Yeah. Raiden yeah, kind well. of seemed excited, but eh, that guy was crazy. Raiden was fucking nuts. <laughs> but he, he represented the player. He really did. Yeah, he he. He really did. And I felt like, and and thank you so much, by the way, David, for coming on. I think this has been yeah. fascinating because it's discussing more than just the beginning, which was just, and I have a list of at least a hundred phrases for you to say, but it's, it's been interesting discussing with someone who has effectively had to act out such a story and watching perhaps not all of it, but some parts of it come true. Yeah. And thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been such a pleasure. Well, thank you for having me. It was a it was a fascinating conversation and nice to talk about something different uh, for a while. Yeah. But also nice that it didn't stray too far from Metal Gear, which is uh, which is uh, a game we all know and love. Thank you so much. Indeed. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I'm always always happy to come back. You go through the rain. And someday you'll feel on a tree frog, it's so dear the trial to survive.